So, yeah, I'm glad that a bunch of you were at um, Mongo World for the last couple of days. I was there too. And um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you largely about my first moments with Mongo. I have used open source databases for a long time, and you know, I'd like to obviously thank Procona for letting me speak here, but also you know, thank MongoDB for existing for, for probably the past nine years or so, because it's made a fairly um, interesting community crop up. So, as Laurie said, I've been around um, the database world for quite some time. I work on another database called MongoDB Server. It's a MySQL fork. And uh, in terms of MongoDB, I'm more or less um, nobody, just beyond being an enthusiast. Um, I went to my first Mongo conference out of curiosity um, in 2012 um, in San Francisco because it was $50 a pop. Like, why not? I could go learn something new. And then uh, about a year later, uh, a company who was making a piece of open source, uh, well, a piece of closed source software that was going to be integrated with a banking framework had asked, had asked me a weird question. Would it be possible to run Mongo um, on a Spark platform? And I said, oh, wow. Ask me about why um, Spark was because back in the Linux days, I used to actually work on esoteric platforms like Power and Spark. So I took a closer look, and uh, it was actually not easy to run it on Spark. So they lost said banking contract. I'm guessing this is not entirely important to most of you because Probably none of you run Spark. Is anybody here on Spark? <laughs> no. Yeah. So that that was my um, like first dabble with um, Mongo, and I've obviously looked at it in recent times to import uh, JSON uh, via the Connect Storage Engine, and I used to enjoy reading the MongoDB Planet, and at one stage it just went missing on MongoDB's website. So I created one of my own, and then Procona made one that's even better. So now you have access to a whole bunch of planets. So um, yeah. So my rough agenda is to cover, you know, I guess you all probably know what MongoDB is, but it doesn't hurt to you know go over it as well. It's had over um, 20 million downloads according to uh, the keynotes, and that's pretty impressive in the last few years. In it, even when uh, MySQL sold to Sun, our number was close to like 12 million. So there are obviously lots more people downloading Mongo. And they said that they've also got lots of uh, Fortune 100 companies who are using Mongo, and that also was uh, fairly impressive to me as well. And apparently over 50,000 people have met to talk about MongoDB. And I guess we make up part of that community as well. I don't know if you've ever been to a MongoDB meetup. I've been to a couple before. And um, it's always there with nice free pizza and beer. And I encourage you to probably go to, to some of the ones that happen nearby where you live. I approach um, all of this largely from a MySQL perspective. Uh, I approach this as a, Mongo, as a MongoDB user getting my feet wet. Um, I think this talk will you know, appeal to beginners and intermediate users. So. It's probably good that it was also in the morning, since, as Peter said, a bunch of you, are, a bunch of the others probably hung over. Um, I've actually been very impressed by the speed at which MongoDB engineers things, and uh, I think the most important thing about MongoDB is they there's probably a lot of myth busting to, to do, and there's also probably a lot of uh, honest talk to do to also talk about things like wire tiger stalls and so forth. In fact, if you started with MongoDB when it, uh, when it first came out, you'd realize that you know, it wouldn't do things like you know, a join, it was just me pure memory mapping. And I draw parallels to how this used to be with MySQL as well, right? I mean, people used to say MySQL was a toy database because it didn't have InnoDB. And it's, it's not a toy database, obviously. So um, there are definitely uh, parallels one can draw to these communities. There have been papers, academic papers that have been written that have been seminal to the database world. Um, if you're a SQL user, it started to, thanks to Todd's paper. Google released a bunch of papers that also spawned a bunch of engines. Amazon released a, a paper that spawned a bunch of engines. MongoDB started around 
in 2009, there were a bunch of extra booklet for they're probably one of the few people that actually pushed the, the NoSQL movement, the idea that you don't have uh, a standard uh, SQL syntax, so to speak. They think about things like the Bayes theorem, the Cap theorem, and so forth. Oh, and um, today you have lots and lots of things uh, that one could use. In fact, if you look carefully at the database offerings since MySQL got acquired in 2008 to now, the open source database offerings probably exceed a hundred, and not long ago this number was just like 60, and it's just growing because everybody writes their own data, data store, and it's extremely exciting if you're into data stores because it provides opportunity. And there'll be talks here about said opportunity, like you know, RocksDB and, and so forth. So MongoDB implemented in pure um, C++, so a little different. Um, when it comes to comparing it to MySQL, where it's a hodgepodge of C and some C++. There's uh, plenty of drivers available, so great for adoption. And again, why? So that it's very comparable to the MySQL playbook, because what we, what we did 10 years ago, or you know, 15 years ago, is exactly what they're doing, but in a fast-forwarded fashion. They've also got, it also makes use of JavaScript, so it helps if you, you've learned some JavaScript to actually make queries, write apps, and so forth. It, um, JSON is its native store. It can store numbers, strings, um, Boolean values, arrays, hashes. BSON is the lightweight binary uh, protocol that's formatted for, for per performance as well as compression. You get, you know, date, uh, in types, ID, and so forth. The idea behind all of this is, I, I grew up in the uh, age of the LAMP stack. And uh, P could have meant many things to people. It could have, been, it could have started with Perl, and you know, PHP probably became the most popular, and eventually things like Rails and so forth. Looking around, I see a lot of people write Rails code against Mongo, as well as Node.js against Mongo. And uh, I don't know if these stacks are really alive anymore. Mean, mean stands for uh, MongoDB, ExpressJS, AngularJS, and Node.js. Today, you live in a world of complex architectures and polyglot uh, persistence that stacks may or may not make sense any longer. So for, for me, why MongoDB? And if you, you were at Mongo World, you saw, you saw this slide of the keynote, uh, at least that quote. You know, after the first three years, it became clear that in terms of LinkedIn member profiles, there's only one trend of the dominance of MongoDB by Matthew Aslett of the 451 group. He wrote that in October 2015 for, from a NoSQL survey. And incredibly impressive. I mean, as I said, there are probably over 100 NoSQL stars now. And, and uh, open source databases. And if you look at the LinkedIn profiles, you really see a lot of dominance. And it could be, one, because you can you know, get access to free training and, and sort of certification if you go do MongoDB training at, at the university. I, I think that's a really good idea and a great way for you to have adoption. How many of you have actually gone and completed a MongoDB university course? Okay. And for the rest of you, <laughs> They have, they have courses for like beginners, intermediate, and they, they even have advanced courses, and they're all, all basically free. I think there's only like one course that's on edX that would, you know, more or less, it's, it's free, but if you want a certificate, you probably pay like 75 bucks or something. It's ideal for agile development. I mean, a lot of people uh, used to have a, a separation between developers and operators, and now there's a DevOps movement. Yeah, the agile development, the fact that there's no you know, hard schema, but they, now you can actually implement constraints actually makes sense. You don't necessarily need a, a caching layer either. So gone are the days where you think about having a memcached layer. And uh, you know, the built-in replication, yes. You know, MySQL said that for a long time. Uh, Postgres got it built in probably in 2009, so huge gap there. And, um, but the cool thing about Mongo is it has automatic failover without external tools. So in the MySQL world today, you use things like MHA written in Perl by Yoshi, uh, who works at Facebook, um, or you use something like a MySQL failover, which is uh, part of the MySQL utilities package. But uh, here, it's, it's just automatic. And uh, sharding out of the box, so no playing around with Fabric, no playing around with MaxScale, Vitesse, Tumblers, Jetpacks, um, 
the spider storage engine. MySQL has all these complex ways for you to do things, really more or less out of the box, and I find that to be quite refreshing from a user perspective. There are a whole bunch of people that use Mongo, and, and the Great Swiss one is actually the, the main reason why I started paying attention to it. Jeremy Zawati is a guy who um, has been known well in the MySQL world, who went to work at Craigslist and spent some time on MongoDB. And uh, one of the things that they came up to say was a problem to us at MariaDB was that it took a really long time for them to do an alter on their archives. So we, so the MariaDB answer was not to fix alter, but was to give you a progress report. So we now have progress reporting built into MariaDB server. But that didn't help Craigslist because their authors were going to take something like three months on the archive data or something. So they moved their archive data into MongoDB. So archive posted in Mongo and live posted in MySQL. There's also obviously Facebook's PARS and um, possibly Islam will talk a little bit more about that as well. And that's one of the reasons uh, why you see Mongo rocks exist. And uh, you can get Mongo rocks obviously in, in Percona server from MongoDB. Some people use it from an uh, analytics uh, standpoint. Business Insider, um, they shared investors with the, the same DoubleClick founders, so they built an uh, entire CMS and business, not on WordPress, like many other companies do, but they built their own on MongoDB, right here in New York, and they sold to um, a German group. Stripe, um, surprisingly enough, said they enjoy using um, MongoDB to send the data to things like Postgres, HBase, and Elasticsearch. Why? Because the uplog is well documented compared to the MySQL binary log. And it turns out that this well documented and ease of use from an API standpoint has also been shared in the um, Mongo Rocks world. It took Facebook less than a year to write Mongo Rocks and go into production compared to the fact they are also doing a RocksDB engine for MySQL called MyRox, which has taken a lot longer than that. It's probably close to two years now, and it's still not uh, fully in production. And again, probably Islam will talk more about that. So uh, many people have commented about the fact that you actually get uh, a lot more ease of use from a program programmability standpoint as well. And uh, Foursquare, I don't know um, if anyone uses Foursquare, I still do, to find what's cool nearby, and I like to check in to remember where I went, because I have a notoriously bad memory. That's also built right here in New York City, and um, it's also powered by Mongo. Um, where do you find it? I'm a predominantly Linux guy, so you find it in all Linux distributions. They provide repositories as well. So it's fairly easy. As I mentioned, it only works on little Indian uh, architectures, and this is still open. In fact, Wire Tiger will not run on uh, on a Spark. The good news is that um, Big Endian is probably dead. Power8 and ARM has have moved on as well. So uh, they're, they're they're more dual Indian now, so it's probably not a big deal. Uh, for me, coming from MySQL, unpacking it and just finding a few files in one directory. That was kind of refreshing. I spent a lot of time packaging MySQL uh, for various Linux distributions and MariaDB for various Linux distributions in the last 15 years. And packaging MongoDB was, was much, much easier. Yes, it does make use of scones, so there is a bit of a learning curve there. And if you compile it to VM, you probably want your VM to be larger than, say, 20 gigs in size. It does actually use up uh, quite a lot of space for compile time. But the fact that it spits out a handful of binaries is extremely easy from a packaging standpoint. It's, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, in terms of test databases, there are not really that many test databases available that uh, I think uh, that, that match the MySQL world. They have this zips called JSON and uh, a primer data set of restaurants. There's no like Sakila sample database. If you're from the MySQL world, you're familiar with things like the world, the menagerie, the Sakila one which starts extending the use of the entire database. And I think that's, there's uh, some uh, room here for improvement. In fact, uh, I managed to find that Guy Harrison, a guy who used to work extensively on MySQL stored procedures, actually has uh, a part of this. But Guy hasn't 
moved on to the modern world of putting it up on GitHub so other people can you know, fork it and so on. So I think there's huge benefits there for us to have uh, some kind of sample database for you to use all the features of MongoDB. Also, when you come from the MySQL world, it's worth uh, remembering that today you have the MongoD, which is the core database, the MongoS, which is the controller uh, for the query router, for shadow clusters, and Mongo, which is the interactive shell. So, a bit more of a different learning curve. One thing I, I totally did drop, though, was storage engines. And, um, you know, coming from a MySQL background, storage engines were, were a big part of MySQL. In fact, MySQL said, we wanted to give you all this flexibility. We won't provide foreign keys in the server. We won't provide, uh, you know, full, uh, full text uh, search in, in the server. We give you the opportunity to use whatever algorithm you wanted, how you store it on, on disk. We wouldn't provide GIS in the server. You'd have to provide it in the engine. And it turns out that all of that was, is what makes writing a MySQL storage engine so much harder. It's probably why MongoRox is in, in production much quicker than MyRox. So, so that, that, that for me was actually pretty interesting. MMV1 to me is more or less my ISAP. It's Wired Tiger. It, it is a B3 based, but it also has an LSM. Wired Tiger has an LSM before. Uh, it was actually plugged into Mongo, but it's not been exposed yet from what I can see. And uh, this is good for you know, document level concurrency, does checkpointing, compression. And uh, the one thing that really stuck out to me was the fact that. Uh, encryption, which is becoming more or less standard today, is only available in uh, the enterprise version of MongoDB. And I don't know how important that is to people, but uh, we spent some time in MongoDB implementing encryption for InnoDB and uh, ARIA with work that was actually done by, by Google largely. So I, I, I actually think that's, that's relatively important today. And there's also MongoRox, which is production ready LSM, where your data is written to your log files. Uh, sequentially to the disk, never modified. You then find a, a compactor thread in the background to make it into a tree structure. And uh, you more or less get a single I.O. that flush tens of hundreds of uh, op operations into disk. It's great, great for inserts. It's um, good for compression. And there are plenty of benchmarks and talks about this from Mark Ella and I'm sure Islam will also share more about this later. There also used to be another engine called Tokyo KV and a product called Tokyo MX and uh, then got renamed to Corona FT. Though I say, I put that formally because I believe this product is sort of EOL and probably Peter will share more about that soon as well. Um, yeah, so, and then there's the in-memory engine, uh, which you can in the future combined with Wild Tiger, but that's also an enterprise only feature. So I find that while the, the, the main open source software is cool, there's a lot of these additions that are enterprise related, which sort of make MongoDB to me, in my mind, kind of open core. You more or less get like 80% of the functionality, but you're still missing out like 20% of what you kind of need. Something else I managed to understand fairly well was the fact that they have so many distributions of MongoDB. Today you get MongoDB, which is the one that you're probably using if you have a Mac you did through install MongoDB. There's MongoDB Enterprise, where you actually get you know cool things uh, like you know the ability to uh, log in via uh, um, Open LDAP or Active Directory, the ability to do audits and so forth. And then, for some reason, my slide probably looks like it has been cut. But um, Percona Server for MongoDB kind of aims to answer uh, all these questions as well. Like, it doesn't have everything that the uh, enterprise version of MongoDB has, but it has quite a lot of things, and they are open. And um, that's that's nice. But if you look at the enterprise tools, tool chain that MongoDB does offer. You'd see things like you know uh, ops manager and cloud manager, so it's you know nicely put inside uh, inside a GUI, so you actually get to execute within a browser. You've got Red Hat Identity Management, you've got you know um, LDAP, you've got Kerberos authentication. That's like a big deal when it comes to financial institutions. We just implemented Kerberos authentication in, in MariaDB, um, and then I managed to at the keynote see things like Compass, 
Uh, the BI connector was pretty impressive uh, with a SQL proxy layer. And I think you know, something like encrypted wild tiger really is important. So, so replication. Uh, you have MongoD, a single server can have many processes. Uh, it, deep data and indexes does generally for recovery. If you think about this, this is exactly like running a single node of MySQL. You have to learn about the idea of majorities and uh, and concerns. So, like you know, one and two servers they make one and two majorities, whereas we have three servers. Two servers are, are the majority. So that was something kind of new uh, for me as well. Replica sets tend to just be a group of nodes, uh, and all members are equal by default, and they replicate between each other uh, asynchronously. The op log, which is if you come from a MySQL or a binary log, is a is a capped collection, which is a fixed size collection that you that allows you to have uh, high throughput operations for inserts. It does um, document retrieval uh, based on insertion order. So um, and it's idempotent. So no matter how you sort of play it back, it it's always looks the same. The other cool thing about you know replication in the MongoDB world is you don't have to pick between. Um, statement-based or, uh, or mixed or row-based replication, it just sort of works. Then you can shard, right? So that you can put replica sets into groups, you get queries that are filtered. Um, it's, it's extremely easy to do and uh, I found that to be cool. The idea that you also do um, Auto sharding, which will distribute data amongst multiple um, replica uh, sets. You also now have the option to have these config servers, like you now need them in MongoDB 3.2 and greater. So th this is all handled uh, relatively transparently. Your application doesn't really have to know much about the fact that you have this backend. What I don't see much in the Mongo world, and I see Percona making an improvement, is is blogging extensively about these things. It's easy to learn MongoDB and get started, but it's extremely hard to be uh, an expert user in MongoDB. And maybe this is because it's only been around for nine years, whereas my skill has been around for 21 years. But I find that the user base of MySQL seems to be a lot more expert and have a lot more uh, workarounds and they've, they've hit a lot more roadblocks and they're, they're more vocal in, in what the roadblocks are and hopefully these other bigger companies hit those roadblocks so you never have to hit them. So uh, when it comes to backups, um, you have MongoDump and Mongo Restore. MongoDump captures your documents in the database in the backup, uh, does not include it, the index data. Mongo, re, uh, Mongo Restore or MongoD must then rebuild uh, the indexes after restoring data. It's also probably worth noting that um, Mongo Rocks has its own backup mechanism called Rocks Strata, and Toki Backup works with Pagona FD. What we don't seem to probably have is an uh, extra backup equivalent, a direct extra backup equivalent in the Mongo world, and I think that would be kind of nice. Or do you know of a direct extra backup equivalent that I've never found? So anybody? No. Okay. So yeah. The, the other common way is to do you know, file system snapshots with LVM. And it turns out that a lot of Mongo users probably run this in EC2. Which is again probably why the MongoDB Corporation decided to launch Atlas this week. Because a lot of people this rollout in EC2 or the rollout in some kind of compute instance, um, be it uh, Rackspace's compute or Google Compute Engine and so forth. When it comes to monitoring, you have MongoStat, and which captures uh, counts of database operations by type, so you get inserts, queries, and so forth. You get uh, distribution information. You also have MongoTop, there's also things like DB service data. There's a host of OSS tools that I think, uh, again, Percona is um, sort of pushing the boundaries here with making this available, so kudos to them. It turns out that if you wanted um, 
more monitoring buoys. Um, several lines probably has some as well. If you want to pay money, there's you know Cloud Manager and U U Relic, Data Dog. All of this also is available, and it's uh, hosted services as well. Database as a service, not as many offerings, and I and the reason when I've spoken to deep database service vendors is largely because MongoDB's AGPL licensed. Vendors usually like to make changes and not share them. So a uh, good example maybe you know Amazon and so forth, they make changes to MySQL that never go back upstream. But it hasn't stopped people like MLab, Object Rocker, uh, acquired by Rackspace, Compose, acquired by IBM to offer um, Mongo a, as a service. But in terms of um, Atlas as well, Atlas is if you're already using Mongo's uh, entire ecosystem where you may be using it for monitoring, you may be using it for backup over the network. Uh, now you can also launch cloud instances, configure shards, and so forth. And I find that to be kind of nice. I mean, it's all point and click. If you're familiar with um, how app the Amazon console works, uh, the demo of Atlas is actually um, really well done, very streamlined, highly impressive. Um, if you're going to start using it properly, it goes without saying you should configure your Mongo, MongoDB.com. It's like your mind of CNS. You know, consultants generally say that uh, more than 80% of your job is done just by reading the production notes. When you go on site, you don't really need to do very much because it turns out these people never read the notes. Um, the manuals are actually really, really good. I suggest reading the production notes uh, closely before you launch in production. There is obviously opportunity to do more than just this because this is very controlled from a MongoDB standpoint. It's, there's opportunity to make a lot more uh, community-based documentation, in my opinion. And that's, that will help share and uh, spread the knowledge and, and love around MongoDB for expert users. And you know, there's so much more that you know we don't have time to talk about, right? It's got an extremely good aggregation framework that's uh, worth looking at. Things like configuring the wire tiger cache, I'm sure you know Vadim will talk about as well, where the idea is sort of like 60% of your memory minus a gigabyte. And there are reasons why this is there, where you know if you come from a, a MySQL world, you say, oh, you know, you put the buffer pool at around 80%. There are all of these like rules that you don't see you know, publicized well, that you sort of learn over time as well. Um, there's one thing MongoDB also seems to do a little bit better than, say, the MySQL world is they focus a lot on sizing and provisioning. And that's largely probably because when you go and speak to a company like IBM, the first thing they ask you is, so what's the sizing guide going to look like? This is not something we're very familiar with in the open source world because we always say you've got a test and so forth. But um, I think from an enterprise standpoint, they've understood that people, enterprise um, employees, seem to like sizing guides. They, they think in sizing guides. So there is lots to think about there from that, that standpoint. And probably even things to build around uh, to help you size things automatically and provision things automatically. Um, learning and demystifying explain. Explain is extremely powerful, even in MySQL. But you know, if you're an optimizing developer, sometimes you need to demystify, explain, you need to explain, explain. So, lots, lots of opportunity there as well. Built-in GIS. So, you know, as I said, one of my favorite apps being Foursquare. You know, that's actually what, what pushes MongoDB uh, forward. You know, when I found user grant, uh, uh, making user roles, I found this to be interesting because when you're granting users, they actually have roles for database users in Mongo, and roles are kind of like what, again, enterprises think of. And you know, we just implemented roles in MariaDB sometime last year. And uh, it's kind of phenomenal that you know, Mongo thought about this much before as well. So again, not, not like a love fest or anything, just things I see as, as kind of unique from an outsider's perspective. Um, you know, Percola Toolkit, great toolkit for MySQL. Needs, needs like a lot more equivalence in the Mongo world. I think more can be done here. And um, you know, I think the way Procona Toolkit started was, it used to be called Market. Market was written by a guy called Baron Schwartz, who makes Vivid Cortex now. And he was 
actually even funded by, you know, partially funded by MySQL and other people. It's going to take enterprise users to fund the developments of these tools that will benefit everybody. So I sincerely hope we start seeing a, Pocona tool, a proper Procona toolkit for MongoDB going forward. You can learn a lot about MongoDB from books. The thing with MongoDB is it moves pretty fast. Every year you get a new release. Writing a book every year is not a very profitable operation. The most recent book that I read was MongoDB in Action, and even that only covers up to MongoDB 3. This definitive guide by Christina Chodera was is actually a pretty good book. It more or less uh, is good for you to read. You get all of this um, probably on like O'Reilly Safari and um, any good bookstore near you. I enjoy reading books, but you don't see high performance MongoDB, uh, you know, high availability MongoDB titles like you do in the MySQL world. And I'd really like to see things that are a bit more beyond just the beginner level. Because I believe my, my usage of MongoDB will also go beyond said level in time. It's, and it's kind of impressive that when you know, I looked at the Compass uh, demo, uh, done uh, a couple of days ago. The guy, the VP in charge of making Compass had only joined MongoDB about six months ago and he was keynoting as well at, at the keynote. So, that, so you know, the learning curve to, to get to where you can be dangerous is actually pretty short. But getting beyond that, that's what we need. We need more shared knowledge. And um, I'm looking to you know, read up more on that and play with that more as well. For well, those of you that um, didn't actually go to MongoDB uh, University yet, I suggest you sign up, it's free. I found the quick reference cards really useful. In fact, they used to give, give them out at these conferences, right? So that's, again, how I kind of got kind of interested in MongoDB. I don't know how many of you also remember getting these MongoDB mugs. I have so many MongoDB mugs. Who has MongoDB mugs? Okay, so they, they must have cleared the warehouse of mugs. Now they're focusing on like, Jumpers. Oh, sorry, we're in America. Hoodies. Hoodies. Yes. My Americans not so good. Um, the little MongoDB people. You can, you know, read this in less than an hour. Play play around, but even that only works up to 2.6. So, great opportunity for someone to actually go on and say, "Hey, we're going to upgrade it. Uh, we're going to make. We're going to set a pull request to make this better." And as I said, I'm really, really impressed by the engineering prowess because, you know, being, being an engineer, one knows how hard it is to make a, a database server, and one knows how long it takes to make releases in database servers. We, we manage, you know, 12 to 18 months. MySQL does about 24 to 30 months. Um, MongoDB manages almost in a 12-month cycle, and it's not like they're just doing nothing or just making incremental changes, right? They have, you know, improved things in in three four that's coming up. You know, you get better document validation. You get improved replica set selection, which is, you know, it happens less than two seconds. You can use big storage engines, so very much like uh, MySQL lookups or like joins dollar lookups. The initial sync, you know, the network broke. Now it will actually, we won't start from scratch. It'll actually just sort of do like an rsync compare later on. You can do collisions per operation, so. Now, coming from a MySQL world, you use Swedish one Latin, right? And before we went to UTF-8, but, you know, so I see some laughter here, but turns out um, you want collations for operations, especially in Europe or Asia, where you may be dealing across multiple collations, especially if you're dealing big. But, um, yeah, and I, I saw a whole bunch of other cool commercial stuff, which I Sincerely hope that would be an open equivalent, like you know, the new connector, the VI connector with the SQL proxy in front. I thought that was pretty cool. Doing things like zone zone sharding, uh, so you can when you're deploying, you can you know have some uh, shards in a certain geographical zone. All this seems to be really really cool stuff. Things that you know we could implement in, in the MySQL world in tooling as well. So you know, kudos kudos to them for doing that. And uh, with that, I guess, you know, I, I'd like to say thank you for listening to me. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity from a community standpoint to make MongoDB better. 
and I hope all you smart people write more blog posts about um, what exactly you're doing with it, how you're pushing it forward. YouTube videos alone are not so cool. We need to read text, we need to see repeatable benchmarks, we need to know shortfalls so when we encounter them, we can fix them and so forth. Yeah, so thank you for listening to me.